and um, and thank you all of you, whoever is here for joining this conversation. Um, yeah, so I mean, basically, uh, the point of curating this space is, uh, you know, to build up a conversation. And obviously, it's not going to be the usual um, traditional lecture pattern because and, and we have been discussing on and off about it that I mean, usually what happens in lectures, you know, we, we it just to a vast extent, it becomes a very unidirectional discourse. And to make it like a kind of what we say in Bengali, usually in the Bengali language, we call it as an adda, you know, where everybody comes together and share their thoughts. Um, so what I thought is like, I mean, officially, though, I am the guest of this conversation, but I want to make it sure that uh, we actually, you know, do the conversation. Um, and we have been, you know, brainstorming together, especially uh, Kashyap and I, that what are the different perspectives that we can bring forth, uh, you know, towards our discussion uh, about food dialogues. And uh, obviously we are planning, we are thinking of discussing different perspectives like um, kitchen spaces, which happens to be one of uh, Kashyap's research forte. And not only Kashyap is, I'm pretty much sure there are also uh, many scholars, many researchers who contacted me separately that they are working specifically uh, on food and kitchen spaces. And there are also scholars here who have also contacted me saying that they are very much interested in a discourse on food and culture and different aspects. So we have been planning that uh, to talk about different aspects like kitchen spaces, Creole foods, colonial foods, decolonial foods, um, crisis foods. And also, I mean, uh, more discourses I am pretty much hopeful are going to come out through this discussion. So obviously at the very outset, I, uh, you know, request all of you just to, you know, feel free to be a part of this conversation. So, you know, not being just passive audience, but being as active participants, uh, the first and the foremost thing. Uh, but yeah, prior to, so to build up the conversation from somewhere, I mean, I would be interested and to once again, you know, break away from the traditional pattern, instead of saying something, I would be interested to put forth the question in front of all of us. And as Kashyabi mentioned that uh, initially for 30 to 40 minutes, I and Kashyabi would be in conversation. Meanwhile, at that time, if you have questions, feel free to put it up in the chat box. And uh, then obviously it would be open up for all the rest of the conversation. So, I mean, um, yeah, so the, now let's start with a very basic question, a kitchen space. Um, so my first question would be, or my first query would be that how do we, you know, interpret a kitchen space? And why do I specifically start with this? Also, I, I think I must, you know, clarify the context because uh, kitchen space personally ha has actually uh, played a very crucial role in my life. Uh, and obviously I'm going to talk about that, how and where and what and, uh, you know, when. Uh, but prior to that, maybe uh, if, if Tarshipi, if you can come forward and start reflecting on the aspect of how do you understand as a kitchen space and how do you interpret a kitchen space or what motivated you to bring the kitchen space into your research discourse? Yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, also, I will make a small announcement before starting. That is, please do not unmute yourselves or please do not turn on your videos during uh, the duration of the conversation. So yeah, coming back to Dr. Shine's question, so what influenced me or interested me? So uh, basically, I started out with food and feminism as my initial topic. And then uh, I started uh, with the help of my supervisor, Dr. Ram Shireti. Uh, I narrowed it onto the kitchen space and that really intrigued me because uh, coming from a Bengali middle-class family with only one working parent, I was uh, seeing my mother work in the kitchen throughout the day and, you know, making feeding us, uh, you know, delicious comestibles and snacks and every time, whatever we want, you know, catering to our whims and fancies. 
and then uh, while growing up i've always seen my aunts my grandmother so for me the kitchen space has always been uh, gendered until uh, a certain point of time when my sister uh, she got married and she was a working woman along with her husband who was also working so that is when i started seeing the kitchen spaces not extremely essentially gendered but something where a shared participation can be possible but yeah again when we talk about my sister or my brother in law they are uh, from from a different class with a different they are they are working in white collar jobs they are working as it professionals so definitely it would be different from what my parents uh, the kind of life my parents were living so for me the this uh, this kind of dichotomy was all uh, was always there this contradiction as to which is uh, which is the right way this or that or is it essentially gendered or is it not or is it something that we can do away with on a on a very basic level or should it continue to be gendered should it, should it continue to be a, a woman's domain only or can we make it more inclusive so that would be like my take on it and i would want uh, dr shayan to also share his experience whether it's on the similar lines coming from a similar bengali background or would would he have something else to add to no thanks um, yes thanks kashipi actually uh, for sharing this insights because when i was listening to you i was just recollecting my experiences and actually there are a lot of you know points of overlapping and also differences as well so obviously considering the fact it's it's very similar with the kind of family uh, background that you come from and which i think is also very crucial for me to um reflect on because it had a major influence on my understanding of the kitchen space in my house and uh, my under, obviously it's it's a one uh, you know person who is earning in the family and obviously we still live in an era where we can't accept a situation of someone called a house husband but we always look forward towards a house wife and obviously we are trying to do away with the term and we are using different other forms of uh, rhetoric like a homemaker or uh, whatever but the mindset the the central mindset of the society remains uh, the very same so by default uh, you know my mother has to be you know uh, take care of the kitchen space and uh, actually the kitchen space to be honest from my very childhood days has been a major space of learning and sharing a lot of knowledges uh, even prior to my uh, you know my introduction to the very formalized space of knowledge a formalized space of science or food or technology or you know uh, you know calculations or the scientific names that we actually learned in our educational institutions later on my uh, process of gaining knowledge my process of literacy that i always see it as you know started from the kitchen space and uh, i mean i i think i i should share a small anecdote to you know contextualize this particular argument of mine um so uh, i mean even still i do it today but that's hab this habit goes back to my like very childhood days the first thing i used to do when i used to wake up in the morning is you know not to brush my teeth or you know clean myself up the first thing i used to do is just rush to the kitchen space and open up the mid safe and see what my mom uh, you know has cooked and uh, usually my mom used to wake up very early in the morning and she is like finish her cooking very early so by the time is to wake up she was almost uh, through her cooking and i will open up the mid safe and find out what she's cooking get that aroma of it and that will give me a kind of a kind of extreme aesthetic pleasure so and and not only that i mean it was not only just for the sake of satisfying my senses but also later on you know uh, when i reflect back today i also feel that was a way of getting acquainted you know with my own food cultures with my own food traditions with the understanding the speciality of the kitchen space who dominates there what occupies there not only in terms of humans but also in terms of spices in terms of food looking at food as a living 
experience, not just something to chew on and munch on and digest and fill up your stomach, but it is a form of a consistent cultural experience for me. Whenever I eat a food, whenever I smell a food, whenever I look at texture of the food, it's not about, you know, just the creating a dichotomy, whether it looks good or looks bad, or whether it appears to be tasty or doesn't appear to be tasty. But it's much more than that for me. And most importantly, so that was one way, you know, uh, getting acquainted with my own cultures, with my own traditions, with my own food uh, styles, the family foods and everything. And then obviously that was also a way, you know, uh, that helped me, that smell actually helped me to get acclimatized with the different names and the different types of spices um, that have been, or that are used in the different types of food items. And then, you know, uh, foods also come with a lot of stories. Like when I started growing up, I used to ask my mother, why do you cook this particular food item? Or why do you use these specific spices to cook this particular food item? Why not something else? So, you know, I, I find that when I reflect on these aspects today, you know, these are quite scientific questions. These are quite logical questions. These are not just the questions about taste, but also it's the questions about intellect, intellectual, uh, you know, developing intellectual abilities to distinguish between taste is also a scientific ability. Now, when you are, you know, you, you put spices in the foods you use, you may use the same kind of spice, but in different proportions for different food items. And that is actually, you know, what teaches you calculations. And there are obviously logical reasons, because if you have a misproportion of the spices, you know how badly it can affect the taste of the food. And then food also teaches you literature. So kitchen space altogether has been a very, you know, a, a, a very um, multicultural, multidimensional knowledge space for me from the very beginning of my existence. And today uh, that I, um, though my research, like it is one of my areas of research interest, I think the kitchen space actually uh, played a, an instrumental role in regulating this interest in me and to develop uh, uh, food epistemologies or curricular, epist I mean, culinary epistemologies uh, that we talk about as, a, as an area of interest um, for me. So kitchen space have been very diverse. The number one part is about the, if I take it as a point of centrality that I was talking about, the taste, the knowledge, okay? And the second part is obviously, you know, you see the gender dichotomy in the kitchen space. And uh, we are all aware of the fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not saying something new when I say that in India, um, still there are a lot of, you know, marriage relationships are based on the performative capability of a woman in the kitchen. How well the women can cook, how well the women can clean the utensils, how well the women can serve the family without complaints. These are some of the factors that are often taken into consideration in case of building relationships, in <laughs> case of building social relationships. So this is, uh, you know, we have obviously different gender perspectives, even within the kitchen space, we have different genders perspectives. But you see, and you also see the ironies, like there are also a lot of families who till today in India follow the rule that a menstruating woman cannot be allowed to enter the kitchen. Otherwise, her, her presence, and you have all sorts of, um, you know, mythical, illogical beliefs and practices that she will spoil the taste of the food and, you know, it's it's unhygienic. Also, and so that you cannot uh, touch the pickle when you are... Uh, yeah, you, you cannot touch the pickle, you know, it's unhygienic and all kind of pseudo-scientific, uh, you know, and illogical spiritual beliefs and practices all come forward. But it is the same women you need on all the other days to cook your food, otherwise you're handicapped, but at the time of menstruation, you don't need that women. So you see, you know, these kind of problematic uh, narratives, problematic practices continue to exist within the kitchen space. So, and then also, you know, uh, you, you see that a male entering the kitchen space and cooking. Now, obviously in the, in the present era, like if I talk about our generation, our present generation of people, it's more or less a normative practice right now that, you know, males can also cook, female can also cook. So people really don't 
say it or kind of celebrate it as a as a special uh, a special achievement by the patriarchy but there was a time if we talk about the time of our parents and the grandparents if a male member knew how to cook or if a male member is entering the kitchen and how to cook you know it is either celebrated as if you know the the, the male is a godly figure who has got godly qualities of cooking but the same thing is not done for the women. I and mean, because the women is expected to cook. I mean, if you're not able to cook, if you're not able to wash utensils, then like, why are you here then? But, mm -hmm. and, and again, either it is look at, looked into an, a, a kind of extra celebratory perspective, number one, or else the second part you see is it is being looked at a ridiculous manner at the time of a parent's time. Like, you know, you are a male and you are, you know how to cook or you're trying to cook, it means that your masculinity your, is in danger. Your ma masculinity is under question. Like, are you really a male? Or, you know, the, you are under, you, know, you are being ridiculed. Or if you are seen helping out your partner or your wife or your mother or any women at your home at the kitchen, it means that you are, you know, you are genetically problematic. You are born with feminine characteristics, et cetera, et cetera. So kitchen space altogether, you know, um, it actually evokes these kind of perspectives when I when I think about the kitchen space. The same kind of uh, the problems, the same kind of narratives, it might have reduced, it might have reduced, it may not be so frequent. There are people to come out vocally and voice against these kind of existing narratives, but still the problem is very much you know embedded in our society at least widely in the in the context of india but i'll make a small point here but quite contradictorily uh, when we talk about uh, like uh, kitchens like public kitchens suppose restaurant kitchens so that is a predominantly male so that doesn't uh, that is not like a compromise that is not like a, a compromising masculinity but it's more like it uh, it creates that conversation that okay, so anything done outside the house is uh, is okay. It's okay to do even if it's cooking. But again, uh, if you see some movies, uh, I, I've seen Chef recently, and then there is uh, something called Machet Jhol in Bengali. There they say that you have studied a lot, so only to become a chef. So even that calls into question. So again, there is a dichotomy about. Uh, about the male chef in the restaurant as well. So how do you see that as a figure and how there are very few female chefs we know of, like I might even know only two or three, but of course uh, with, uh, with the Indian cooking, we have Sanjeev Kapoor and Ranveer Brar and you can, you know, every other day there is someone new. So how do you, how do you perceive this, like this kind of, no, absolutely. I mean, Kashabi, this is something interesting that you shared. And let me tell you, I mean, I look at this perspective, but obviously this is my personal opinion, my personal way of perceiving this. Um, everybody is free to disagree at any point of time, but I see it less of a practice of gender equality and more of a practice of exoticizing the patriarchy further. Why is it so? Because even, I mean, if I just go back to the points that I was sharing that there was a time that if a male person is cooking in the kitchen, especially at the time of her parents and grandparents, either that was ridiculed or the other thing that was, that was glorified, that wow, he's with godly powers. So a male, it is, you know, a male is expected to exist even if it is a kitchen space to exist in the most exotic spaces of the world, which a female is not expected to exist. So a restaurant is an exotic space. If being a chef is an exotic uh, kind of, you know, uh, a form of profession where there are chances of, you know, being the celebrity, where you have a chances of getting the glamour, owning the glamour, and also, you know, kind of creating the discourse. See, it is kind of for me a very confused parallel state of glorification of the patriarchy and the consistent normalization of the subjugation of the female space. So a woman 
because a woman is expected to cook so there is nothing exotic about it there is nothing special about it there is nothing great about it and rather if you don't know to whatever you are you are an engineer you are a doctor you are a ceo of a company you are the president you are the prime minister whatever you are still today widely in the indian socio cultural situation you are expected to cook pack the tiffin boxes for your husband and children send them to school and then do whatever you want so for women these are not achievements these are basic necessities but for a man it's the luxurious thing to do you know a man i mean it's against the still the it's very much against the parameters of patriarchy that a man is supposed to cook so you know people use on the one side you know having more male chefs than female chefs you see you know men predominantly occupying these exotic spaces is one reason to actually normalize the exoticization the glorification of the patriarchy and the number two is to hide the uh the differences that we have with the female space to hide the gender hierarchies you normalize a narrative that how can you see that male cannot cook you see male can cook and they are so famous so you know this is a very complex parallel narrative that goes all together and this is how i perceive because this is absolutely a very you know a, a kind of a, a very important question and i have seen in my family like for instance i'm just giving a basic example i'm not going into restaurants and chefs and all i mean in my family i have seen the you know male members cooking when they have to cook something specially for the guest yeah. when they're cooking a special dish for the guest so then it's like you know the male member comes in and cooks like a, an expert and moves out of the kitchen and that you know and you see the appreciation when it is presented to the guest it is also a form of discourse you see the appreciation that particular dish is appreciated is expected to be appreciated more than the dishes that might have been cooked by a female member because you are expected to cook good you are expected yeah. to cook good you are expected to serve your guests with delicious food so what is there to appreciate but see the male member that male member is not expect to cook but that male member comes cooks and cooks a delicious food so that's a like a glorifying achievement so yeah, you see that also how, takes you know, me that, yes. that also takes me back to my father like he used to cook like maybe once a month and everything will be ready and he doesn't know where it is it's like uh, he's walk he's walking into a feminine zone so it's it's already a feminine zone so he's losing a part of himself and then he is walking into that zone and after that everything is set for him like the smallest of the acts the subdivisions of the cooking have been fixed for him and he just needs to go there and do everything in sequence and while there are you know his wife is there and like my mother and my sister they are there as accompaniments and then when the dish is ready he gets all the credit because uh, being a man in the kitchen because in a woman's absence only another woman should uh, should take it from there like uh, in a in a wife's absence the mother or in the mother's absence the wife so it's it's that kind of an equation but when a man walks in it becomes completely different which i feel is changing now i mean you would be able to uh, tell about that because uh, you've been married and you know uh, uh, you would be able to tell whether you shared those responsibilities or you rely entirely on your partner no no absolutely i i totally agree with you and as i was saying that in the present generation things have changed a lot i mean the first thing is obviously um and also which is something i think uh, neelam was also pointing out here that isn't it okay to consider cooking as a life skill mm -hmm. i mean i was actually about to see on this aspect that now cooking is actually life skill and also it's because we are venturing more out of our spaces of comfort you know it's a, it's a wide cultural discourse once you start addressing the issue of food and kitchen so many other perspectives comes into the discourse and obviously one one major you know aspect is if you see again going back to the time of our parents and the grandparents you know children there was especially within the setup of west bengal if you see widely you know the culture of moving out of your home and going out for work 
or moving out of your state and staying in the hostel for a long period of time and taking care of yourself was not the usual ritual. So people were born and brought up in a very comfortable, homely space where you're served with food, mostly performed, this service mostly being performed or rather exclusively being performed by the women. And then you are born and brought up in a very comfortable space where you don't have to cook, where you don't have to think, just you order and you get like a restaurant and for free. So, you know, that culture has widely been dismantled in the current era. People are for work, for the sake of studies, for the sake of degrees, you need to stay in the hostel. And obviously, whether you want or you don't want, you have to learn the basic life skills like cooking, washing, ironing your clothes, cleaning, etc. So I think in from that perspective, in my situation, it has been the same where for cooking and obviously personally, I am very fond of eating and I'm very fond of cooking as well. And this is another amongst various other reasons why it actually makes me, uh, you know, so interested in this particular discourse. So obviously I don't, you know, expect my partner to cook for me. But yes, one expectation has been obviously, and still it's, it's there, is that I always wanted a partner who loves to eat and cook, not for the sake that she, when I'm married, I'll just sit back and, you know, uh, sleep and snore and she will prepare things for me. But, you know, it's about uh, having something in common of kind of sharing, where again, I'm saying like, where I always understand that food is not about, and it's not just about the taste, but it's also about sharing and caring knowledges. It's about building together a space of care and share where you learn, where you learn about different types of tastes, different types of ideas. It is a form of aesthetic taste. So for me, obviously, it has always been an equally divided job. It has always been an equally divided job that, you know, we cook together, we wash together, we think of cooking innovative things together. And obviously, I mean, this is actually another perspective, you know, it also, you know, makes me, makes me, uh, this particular discourse on kitchen space actually invites me to also think um, in the line of the kind of foods we cook, because the hierarchy not only lies who cooks the food, hierarchy not only, hierarchy is not only lies in terms of um, where it is being cooked, where we are getting the food from, but also what kind of foods are being cooked. And which is actually another very diverse and you know a, a very complex space to deal with. So obviously here my question would be that, and it is, I mean, for everybody, I mean, you can just also put your comments here uh, in, the, in the chat box. That is when we talk about foods, we always, if you're interested in discourse in foods, we always try to trace its origin. And we have clear cut divisions in India, you know, that this particular food is actually, uh, is a typical Bengali food. For example, if, if a lot of people, whenever they meet Bengalis, they have this pre-constructed notion that Bengali means maj bhat. Okay. Always they have this pre-constructive notion that all Bengalis eat rice and fish. And it is not only the people who are not Bengalis, but also Bengalis have a perception on their fellow Bengalis. Like if you're not fond of fish, right. if you're fish. not fond of you're rice. <laughs> yeah, and if you say that I am very fond of paneer, you know, they have a very weird and, uh, you know, they have a very uh, alienated approach towards you and their tendency is either through mockery or cracking jokes, they want to make sure they want to make you feel that you are actually not a Bengali. And it is for similar other cultures as well. For example, there is this connotation of South Indian food. Okay, this connotation of now, what is this connotation of South Indian food? That's South Indian dosa food sambar. Ili dosa sambar. That's it. Nothing else. They don't know anything, first of all. But you know, if, you, if you think deeply about it, you will see that this very construction of South Indian okay. food is so problematic. Because also South the construction of the state. South Indian. It is like exactly. five states. It's exactly. not just one so, identity South Indian. Absolutely. Indian. And you know, within those five states, you just don't have five different varieties of cuisines, but there are so many multiple innumerable layers of layers of varieties and sub varieties, which you obviously cannot count and finish. So, and similarly, if you're going to Bombay, I mean, as if you don't have vada pao, you should be shot dead. 
people react oh in bombay you didn't have vada pav it means you had nothing in your life so you know these constructions you know these stereotypes that are being constructed in terms of foods and tastes uh, you know and in terms of states is also quite problematic which actually makes me think that how do we trace the origin of foods so maybe you know kashyap you can you know share some reflections about that how do you understand this construction of the discourse about origin of foods or rather what we often mistakenly call as authentic cuisines you know we see north indian authentic cuisine south indian authentic cuisine bengali authentic cuisine punjabi authentic cuisine so if you can you know share some thoughts about it yeah so basically when we uh, talk about authentic it's more like you know you impose something as authentic that it might or might not be authentic like suppose uh, when we go abroad so chicken tikka masala is like authentic indian so they do not know a, a lot about the variety of foods that is available in india like from north to south east to west the food is completely different but when when they talk about indian food it's like chicken tikka masala or chicken butter masala i i, I think i remember reading uh, about a certain foreign minister in britain he talks about uh, chicken tikka masala as the national food of britain because it has a lot of people from the diaspora and how that kind of fights with the authentic we do not have any authentic indian anymore we do not have any authentic punjabi or authentic uh, south indian anymore it's all a mix and match it's all uh, we are trying the, this this new thing called fusion cuisine so you get like uh, uh, nitrogen in uh, papri chaat or these kind of colonial gastronomy they call it so they add a lot of uh, twist to to these uh, authentic foods like uh, suppose i remember going to a restaurant in uh, kolkata it, it, it's its name is very authentic it's called chakpuri but they have all kinds of fusions in in bengali dishes like a bengali dish called dab chingi has been given a uh, mexican twist something like that so when we talk about authentic not necessarily it's it's supposed to be like uh, it's it's not supposed to be a an imposition of the authentic it's supposed to be rather open because no one really knows what what authentic is uh, and considering indian food we do not have a lot of written evidence except i think uh, kkhir's uh, the indian companion the history of indian food so that's like one or two comprehensive deeds about it so when we talk about authenticity i do not think it should be uh, an, uh, an imposition but it should rather be left open because there is not one fact, like we cannot just um, uh, surround chole bhature as punjabi food or uh, idli dosa as uh, south indian food because i think in uh, karnataka we have bangu pav in kerala we have appam motta curry we have Uh, we have other various other dishes which which are not on the mainstream. But then again, the moment we see South Indian food, we always shift to it becomes a summary. We cannot uh, we cannot talk anything other than that. At the moment, we talk about uh, people from Odisha and Bengal. We talk about much more. We talk about the Osho Bengali with very different accent. So that that is in a way very very problematic. No, absolutely, absolutely. I hear you, and also, I mean, in fact, apart from the points, very crucial points that you mentioned, a few things. If we trace the kind of spices, the kind of raw materials that we use in our foods on a daily basis, it will actually make us so much clear that every food item that we have today is a version of a Creole food. every food item now for instance i mean i uh, again coming from citing some examples from the bengali cuisine you know we have this shukto which is quite a reputed bengali cuisine like uh, quite a reputed food item in the bengali cuisine and we have this you know usual tendency or we usually have this kind of thought in our mind that shukto is a traditional bengali food or when we say potoler dorma 
that is you know the stuffed i don't know if potol is english most probably called pointed goat please correct me if i am wrong because i am very poor of for the you know english with no, uh, you know vegetables is, and food it, items it is pointed goat yeah so uh, pointed goat now what is potle dorma those who are not familiar it's actually pointed goat and where you stuff you know you can stuff vegetables you can stuff paneer you can stuff chicken you can stuff fish and what like it's a stuff pointed goat you know so potle dorma or shukto you know we usually we were, we were born and brought up imagining that these are authentic bengali foods but actually if you do a historical investigation you see that they are not bengali foods now for example for example if you look at the shukto shukto emerged from a very portuguese way of cooking shukto is of portuguese origin and this very trend in fact this very trend that are followed by the bengalis to use you know bitter goat in the foods and to give it a you know a twist in the taste to use the usage of bitter goats in the food like you know if you are familiar with the bengali food structures they use bitter goats in dal they use bitter goats in vegetables and which is obviously you know apart from being healthy those who like the taste of bitter goat it's tasty for them as well this very process this very culture of using bitter goats in the food items has been imbibed from the portuguese because if you read very briefly of the original shukto what happened this culture in portugal of using bitter goats in items in salads actually was very much prevalent now in salads basically they have this habit of using a lot of dress ups like they dress the salad with lot of things so when they came in india like in especially in bengal they didn't find that those dressings and all so then they asked the khanshama or the cook basically you know you prepare something like this for us with whatever things you have and then the you know cook went into the kitchen you know mixing you know getting ideas from what the portuguese wanted obviously there was also a kind of language gap so whatever he could make out from what the portuguese said people said he mixed up with the indian spices and then you know shukto was born and if you also look for the you know potle dorma or the stuffed pointed goats you see it's a you know it is actually of little bit of portuguese origin and little bit of anglo indian origin because you know the very introduction of india to you know different kind types of cheese you know paneer is also is a kind of cheese was actually done by the portuguese you know prior to the arrival of the portuguese there was no tradition of consuming cheese in food items or in sweets but it was actually introduced by the portuguese and i mean there are ample of examples if you look at the origin of the potatoes and the tomatoes and you know if you look at the origin of the cabbages how they came traveled across continents how they originated some of them originated in latin american spaces traveled across continents and came to a place how they are being cooked the way in which the spices are being mixed to cook the food so you know it's so difficult so complex to sit and talk about you know authentic cuisines in any parts of the world like for instance today i am in uh, like uh, right now i am in south africa and uh, you know those who have the basic idea about slave trade you must be knowing that a lot of indians as slaves and indentured laborers and small scale and large scale merchants came to south africa since the 14th century at the time of the dutch slave trade and then the east india slave trade and so many things mostly the dutch slave trade so i mean if you look at the food uh, the very culinary culture here it's it's very integrated it's so much mixed with each other it's so difficult you know to segregate that oh this is an original south african food or this is an original indian food like for us is just uh, two days back you know i got a a package of bakeries from a nearby shop and uh, you know what is interesting is i opened up that bakery and all those varieties of bakeries you know they were all a mishmash of taste of at one point of time you will feel it tastes like german bakery or the other point of time you're going to feel like it tastes like some kind of indian sweet at point of time you will feel like it tastes like a dutch bakery thing so the tastes are so much mixed up so you know even you know i i remember a, a year back actually it got published this year but a year back i and one of my you know um, colleagues from the university of kwazulu natal who also kashipi knows and we are working together for a book on food her name is rosina okay. mart and um, 
we wrote a paper together on decolonizing food habits. And you know, this question consistently haunts us through the paper that how do we identify sitting today? What are colonial food habits? Because there is a, so much of a mishmash of tastes and spices and ingredients. So this is something very you know, interesting that actually also you know, uh, uh, intrigues me a lot to think about that every food item, but we, you know, we actually fail to understand this, that every food item is a Creole food item. In fact, you know, uh, I don't know how much you are aware of it. There, is, there are like two very amazing scholars, one from uh, the King's College London. Uh, she is Professor Ananya Jahanara Kabir. And another is Ari Gautier. Uh, he's actually, uh, you know, in the in the creative field, and he's actually he is a French Creole. Okay, he has his uh, origin traces from Pondicherry and France, so he's a mixed race of France and Pondicherry. And he is actually, you know, the one. Both of them works fantastically on these aspects of Creole foods, and they have this platform called the La Tenai Creole you know, where they talk about Creole foods, Creole fashion, and they talk a lot about Creole foods there. And there, when you listen to the different kinds of desserts that we are having, the different kinds of breads that we are having, the different kinds of the drinks that we are having, you find everything is Creolized. So in sitting in that situation, I think it's very important to, you know, collectively come forward, you know, and talk about and dialogue on these aspects that, you know, um, what is Creole food and uh, whether ever we can ever have anything an authentic cuisine at all. If also, I think that is a very important question, I think we should all ask each other. Yeah, because in every part of the world, we have these kind of mixed foods. I remember uh, we had some students from Mauritius in Banaras Hindu University and they actually invited us uh, home. And uh, there was this person who was trying to trace his origin because they do not have any documents to prove their origin. So he invited us for dinner and uh, he uh, made uh, dhol puri. He was actually calling it dhol puri, but basically it's dal puri, uh, a kind of a flat bread stuffed with dal. So all of these people, they were actually their uh, forefathers were indentured laborers in, in sugar uh, fields or indigo plantations. So that is how it's all a mix. We cannot call anything as like purely authentic or purely North Indian, or purely South Indian, or as, as a fact, purely Indian, because it's also a mix of Indians, Bangladeshis, and Pakistanis. So we have a few comments. I think we can read them because uh, this conversation is going to go on and on. It's like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I think uh, it's good that we can, you know, take the questions and the yeah. comments and then so keep Atul the conversation. So Singh, he says that I think regarding the dismantling of cooking as a gendered space, the introduction of newer technologies, uh, my laptop is acting up. Uh, the introduction of uh, newer technologies which have eased and comforted working in a kitchen is also a significant factor. I would be happy if the speakers shed some light, of, light on that. Yeah, definitely I think introduction of newer technologies is, is a significant uh, factor in easing access in the kitchen for both the male and the female. Of course, with, uh, with more women in the working force, it makes it easier with a lot of appliances. But we also need to look at the fact that these appliances or these newer technologies are not available to everyone. There is a gap. We, we can talk about a certain class which has access to all these uh, technologies, but not everyone. So uh, down the line, uh, I think in a, in a lower class or a lower middle class, I think it still is more gendered because they do not have have that access or they do not have that kind of an awareness to make it more inclusive. What, what do you think about that? No, yes, absolutely. I think Atul, uh, you raised a very interesting point. And to continue with the points that um, Kashipi just shared, I think, uh, you know, looking at, you know, trying to um, bring together a discourse of technology with respect to the kitchen space is again a very unfurls a very complex picture in front of me. Now complex why, number one, and also I think this response also kind of resonates 
to a certain extent with Anita's uh, question as well later, that um, the number one, obviously, uh, you know, br bringing in technology in the kitchen space have eased the work of the women where you can use a mixer, mixer right now and to, you know, mix up the spices and everything earlier, which was completely done manually. Uh, that is fine. Obviously, the challenge is what Kashabi mentions. There is this challenge of affording as well. Number two, you know, there is another challenge that looks in front of me. The challenge is in which the diversity of tastes are dying out because of the availability of technologies. Now, what I mean by diversity of taste today, if you don't want to cook anything, you just want to have a biryani, you can simply get a packed biryani, you boil some water, you put the rice there, they have given what to do and what not to do, you follow the instructions. And in 15, 20 minutes, biryani is right there. But the question is, you know, these kind of mechanical technological elements where you have different kinds of objects that you are used to make the food or the food is technologically available, ready to cook for you. In that circumstances, I think somewhere, somewhat the diversity of the taste, the uniqueness of the taste is dying. So I, by saying this, obviously, I don't mean to construct a discourse that technology should not enter the kitchen. Technology should be there in the kitchen, considering all forms of putting into all forms of context to the forefront. But also, I think it is important for us to be a, be a bit careful socially, culturally, and from other perspectives, a bit careful about the extent to which we want to use the technology. On the one side, obviously, we should think about the time, we should think about the easiness, but on the other side, we should also try to, you know, think about not killing the diversity of the taste that used to be a part of a kitchen on a habitual basis once upon a time. I don't know if that kind of, you know, response to your question yeah, I mean, please feel definitely free to... that makes sense but there's another thing that uh, comes up uh, do organized sector think males are more capable handling the kitchen than females is it a question of capacity while women are charged uh, with managing home kitchen and males are charged with managing the working kitchen or the restaurant kitchens yeah i think i, I think that's a that's a very important point mona lisa that you raised that because uh, it is indeed true that uh, exactly it kind of you know connects to um, connects to the points that I was sharing at the beginning that males are expected to be always be in the exotic space because usually the patriarchy has taught us that males are better managers than females. You know, males are better managers than females, so males can handle situations in a more capable way than the females, and. Um, I mean, obviously, and uh, there is also, you know, very underlying manner, this construction is also there that women are meant for homes, whether it's a kitchen, whether it's a bedroom space or the whatever other spaces, women are meant for homes, women are not expected to be outside the home space. And this narrative may not be so predominant, may not be so badly visible as is to be 50, 60 years back, but it is so much, you know, so much firmly embedded within our habitual existence that in many social spaces, many professional spaces, it has been normalized. Because even if you just move out of the kitchen space and if you just um, share some basic examples, we see that um, still women have to struggle much, much more than males to be a CEO of a company or to be a head of a project. So this discourse is very much embedded already so much normalized in our obviously it's very dangerous but it's dangerously normalized that women are meant to be you know poor managers um, as compared to the men so obviously i kind of agree with you that uh, obviously it's a, it's a, it's a question of the capability you know it's about a way of questioning the capability of the uh, women's women to take charge of the kitchen space in a restaurant i think that is also like a rejoinder to what neelam says that we are, when the earning component is attached to any job it automatically uh, falls on the male so when Absolutely. you're cooking at home it's it's free it, you you're not paid 
for it. But when you're cooking at, at a public space, then maybe it, it needs to be paid. It needs to be more structured. Also, or maybe it, it also has got to do with, uh, with the women's physical strength as to when you're work, work, working in a restaurant, you're working in a more large scale kitchen, doing with a lot, uh, heavier uh, utensils or more amount of manual work. So we could probably uh, put it like in, in this absolutely. aspect as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think Suresh has also a question, but prior to that, uh, I think I, I see um, one with the name of HSS IIT Tirupati has raised the hand. So. Okay. No, you can ask later. You can perhaps take the other questions. What up to you? Okay. I don't know how you what uh, uh, you're following. Is there a no, no, I mean, we are not following actually any order. It's a very disordered, uh, practically disordered conversation. So uh, please feel free to come in. Okay, no, just that there were others who asked questions before me. So I don't want to get in. Then it's okay, no problem. You can go. Yeah, ahead. so no, I was just, uh, you know, it's very interesting for me. I'm not from uh, uh, this area of research. I'm a social scientist. Um, and generally, one of the big problems that uh, we face in our field is uh, the uh, economization of poverty and the culturalization of gender. Uh, and somehow I felt uh, that perhaps uh, it would be really interesting for uh, you know people like us to understand how you all see this. Because in all the discussion that has been happening till now, we've been talking about patriarchy, culture. We've been talking about as if these roles that men and women are, uh, have been subdivided into is somehow uh, uh, you know, a cultural phenomenon. But uh, what a lot of people have been talking about in recent years you know, the social reproduction theory, uh, the feminist political economy, and also the uh, uh, much of the work on uh, uh, recent work on political economy of racism, is that many of these kinds of social inequalities that one sees uh, have sort of a huge economic dimension to them. It's simply not about uh, culture being outdated or culture being such. Uh, and this is why perhaps, I mean, it should be interesting to see uh, what your uh, take on this is. And the second sort of very quick point is uh, I was rather surprised uh, that there was no mention of caste. I mean, you're talking about food, you're talking about gender in the Indian context, and uh, there's no discussion on intersectionality, there's no uh, discussion on how uh, perhaps women's pay, uh, role in uh, the kitchen varies by caste. And so I found the examples that both of you took from your personal lives very interesting. But, uh, you know, I think one also has to keep in mind one's positionality in, uh, in uh, society, right? So I would like, uh, th these are two comments, questions, maybe I'd like your take on it. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, when you talk about caste, we have definitely, when we were talking about the kitchen, we wanted to discuss it. That was one of our agendas that uh, caste battles inside the kitchen. And Dr. Shyam is also working, uh, he's working on a paper on that. But because of the flow of the conversation, we couldn't get there uh, to the caste aspect of it. We kept on uh, around authentic, inauthentic, and then uh, gendered and non-gendered and all these binaries. So I think since he's already working on that, he would be better able to talk about uh, the caste aspect of the kitchen space. No, sure. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you so much for raising these two elements. Um, yes, coming to the caste discourse, obviously, uh, we have so many things to talk about caste, and I was actually about to venture into that state of caste when, uh, when you actually asked your first question, because uh, when you bring the economic dimension uh, with respect to our, and obviously since we are conversing on food, so I would also like to bring in the question of how our tastes, how our understanding or how our food habits are also widely underlined with our economic status. And obviously, when we discuss the economic status, the, the perspective of caste also falls automatically into our discourse because it is always not just the situation. So it is always not just a poor financial situation, but also a lot of cultural situation, a lot of caste factors also comes to the forefront in our discourse. And um, I, I personally, I mean, there are so many things to talk about, but just to say a few things. The first is um, obviously 
when we engage with the question of crisis foods, that actually, you know, the question of economic and the caste dimension pushes me to the state of crisis foods. Uh, and how the crisis foods, the foods which were actually once, uh, you know, regarded as were consumed at the time of environmental crisis, at the time of economic crisis, uh, has actually been, you know, has undergone a kind of capitalistic makeover. So first of all, those crisis foods were criminalized and were actually uh, regressively described as unhygienic and, unhygienic and tasteless first by the European colonizers. And then they are the ones later on who actually capitalistically transforms those food as like really expensive foods. For example, if I take the case of uh, alu, alu posto bhat, or for example, a posto and rice, okay, posto is actually the seeds of, with which actually opium is made. And then when the European scheme, uh, they first of all, actually they criminalized uh, the growth of opium or the posto seeds. And, uh, but for the people, for the local people at the time of droughts and the time of severe crisis, uh, who couldn't afford any kind of vegetable, who couldn't afford any kind of basic food items. For them, uh, posto was a means of survival because it has a lot of medicinal values until and unless it is transformed into opium and taken as a drug. It, is, it has a lot of medicinal values. Like for instance, it keeps the body calm, it soothes the nerves. In, in terms of at the time of extreme hot weather, it serves like, you know, it just helps you to ease the temperature of your body and it is good for the organs and so many you know different other positive sides but first you know posto was you know became a a kind of way cultivating posto cultivating those seeds became a kind of criminal act but later on right now today we see that how you know capitalistic orientation has transformed this posto completely and it is one of the most expensive things that we need to buy from the market so I mean, I address the economic way or economic perspective of addressing our food habit, habits and culinary practices uh, from one of these perspectives. And the same goes for, you know, the Litti Chokha thing as well, what we refer to as famous as Bati Chokha. I mean, Bati Chokha was again a kind of crisis food. And, you know, uh, in, our, in our childhood days, many people would say that this is, what kind of food is this? This is so tasteless. And, you know, it, it, it has nothing to do. It is only burnt. There is nothing cooked in it, etc., etc. Now, when Bati Chokha comes out as a brand under branded restaurants, now it has become like you know once one of the things to look after in in our country and outside our country as well so i mean economic dimension of food i think you know there is a lot of influence of capitalism in shaping our food habits and culinary practices and that actually again you know invites us to revisit the very concept of taste the revisit the very concept of taste that are is the is this phenomenon of taste completely biological or it is cultural as well because i i personally know a lot of people who basically visit those uh, junk food uh, you know branded junk food spaces you know just for the sake of gaining a kind of social status yeah. i know a lot of people you know who are going visiting pizza huts and you know KFCs. all pizza factories and kfcs and all those kind of american nandos and all kinds of american brands you know, just for the sake of, you know, gaining a social status. So for them, taste is not just a biological taste. For them, taste is not to think about whether, you know, um, it really makes me feel happy in terms of my tongue, but it is actually, it makes them feel happy because they come back home with a kind of pseudo-constructive mindset that if I'm frequenting these places, it means people think that I have a high social status. So economic perspective has always been, uh, you know, playing a pivotal role in shaping our food habits. And especially, for instance, again, uh, if you look at the kind of ways in village foods are cooked in general, uh, in general, if you look at the village foods are cooked, you know, it is the extravagant use of chilies. Why village foods usually have a usage of a lot of chilies in their foods as compared to what we see in the cities. In the cities, and one of the major reasons is again that economic perspective comes to the forefront because you know they don't have that liberty, you know, to choose to cook a lot. There are a lot of poor families who fail to cook food items in a you know in significantly to food to feed their families effectively. 
So if you are putting a lot of chilies and you are making it very hot and spicy, in that case, what happens? Normally, biologically, we know that it is very difficult to consume spicy foods in a lot of amount. It is very difficult to consume hot foods in a lot of amount. After consuming for a little amount, we feel that we are full because it is that chili that you know burns our senses and gives us that feeling. So it is another, again, you know, so obviously our culinary practices, I totally agree with you that our culinary practices, our way of cooking, the way of, you know, you know, measuring the spices, the kind of spices we do is actually has a lot of, lot to do with our economic state as well. And that actually also translates to the discourse on casteism as well, because obviously, uh, you know, communal and caste elements uh, plays a lot of role. And I think it also, um, I don't know, it kind of, of uh, resonates uh, with somebody, uh, uh, you know, mentioning about uh, pure, uh, yes, I think it's from Shaguta, who says that uh, not only authentic, but we also talk about pure food, because I know there are restaurants which says pure Brahmin food. I know pure there Jain are restaurants, food also. yes, pure Jain food, you know, so, you know, this concept of purity with food, uh, with respect to the usage of spices, because one major reason why people consider, uh, like one amongst many reasons why people consider the use of onion and garlic, and to a certain extent, some people consider it as ginger as well, that it connotes or it comes to the category of non-vegetarian because widely the use of garlic, onion and garlic in our food habit were centrally introduced by the Muslims after the Islamic invasion in a country the usage, the regular usage of onion and garlic came to the forefront as a habitual part of food. So that's why it actually kind of offended the, the high caste Hindu gatekeepers at that time that, uh, you know, their pure, so-called pure food habits have been disrupted by these invaders. And that's why to maintain that purity, you know, uh, it has actually been a part of our, widely become a part of our food habits and culinary practices as well. So caste and also the kind of not only the food items, but also the kind of meats that are consumed, you know, by the yeah. people of which different also, castes. Uh, which also takes us back to Bengal, where you have separate Hindu hotels and Muslim hotels. Yes, because, yes. Uh, because of the difference in consumption of meat. And other yes, the difference is consumption of meat, not only in the types of meat, but also in terms of the way it is being cut and consumed the way it is being pieced and consumed. So, you know, there are a lot of, obviously there are a lot of, and there also, you know, we know this categorization of Dalit foods. I, I mean, I was reading an article um, a kind of few weeks back where still, you know, in the police lines, I was reading an article where still widely in a lot of police, police lines in, in different parts of India, where you have a separate Dalit kitchen, where you have a separate Brahmin kitchen. So even like in amongst the police, they may be doing their duty, you know, together, but they, uh, when it comes to the time of cooking the food, the food is cooked in different kitchens and served in different utensils. So, you know, there are differences in the kind of spices that are used. Caste differences also calls for the kind of vegetables that are consumed. Caste differences also called for the kind of way the food is cooked. So I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a very important, uh, you know, part of our discourse to uh, see. Also the and also thank you of, so much for bringing it up. Also the employment of domestic helps. So you don't uh, assign those roles to people from certain caste. You have that within, within your own caste. You prefer to. I don't know how much it is there in and around us, but definitely I have seen people who do that. Like upper class Brahmins do not want to keep Muslims or people from lower castes as their domestic helps. Yeah, absolutely. And also, lastly, by uh, Onita Pal, she says that uh, um, about uh, Swiggy and Zomato, how they are deconstructing the kitchen space and human relationships. So I would say that definitely Swiggy and Zomato are making it easy uh, to, you know, for working uh, couples, it's, it's definitely making it easier for them and lessening their burden. But I don't think it, uh, it essentially changes the kitchen space. The kitchen space remains that. You have to, one day or the other, you come up to cooking. You, you do not order on a daily basis because there are questions of nutrition and there are questions of hygiene that, that have to be posed in this. 
and essentially a woman also takes care is supposed to take care of the hygiene hygiene aspect of it so definitely the kitchen space culture is not destroyed entirely but uh, with the coming of technology it's changing it's becoming more uh, diverse and becoming more dynamic uh, dr shayan maybe you can add to that no no absolutely i mean i i in, in fact i personally very much believe that um, you know the kitchen the, the very aspect of cooking i mean it's it's not just about um <clears throat> it's not just about an exercise of cooking or taking a responsibility but the aspect of cooking is also something which is which is a kind of aesthetic practice we often like like the for like us we who likes to cook it's it's like painting it's like singing it's like dancing it's like playing a musical instrument so i think you know swiggy and zomato is really not going to overpower the kitchen space uh, rather i see it as a contrasting way that it is obviously a very good space to create a lot of job opportunities and at the same time you know uh, allowing the domestic kitchen space on the one side allowing the domestic kitchen space to venture into the public space like for instance nowadays you know you can simply start a home delivery system by registering your name just you can cook from your home and you can register your name on the swiggy and zomato and you can get orders and deliver your items so it is in a way you know diversifying the public kitchen space where you are not just relying exclusively on the capitalistic restaurant foods but also you have the homemade foods which are you know going into the public space so i think um, yeah this is also something which is interesting uh, you know an interesting aspect an interesting contribution of these different types of food apps and i think suresh actually had a question i think which we have missed um, at the beginning and he asks that when i enter any restaurant i see only male who is cooking there why so why can't we reserve that for the female who had already experienced because i think we have more or less answered this you know question uh, you know we have tried to address this issue with respect to the gender dichotomy perspective and also uh, you know if we have to really overcome it's it's a long process you know it's very difficult to come up with a solution over a you know one hour discussion it's a long process it's a long cultural undoing we have to undergo actually because this is so much embedded within our culture this is so much embedded within our perspective in our uh, in our uh, reflections that by default a woman no matter what she does she is less capable to meal this particular ideology is so firmly so normatively embedded that even people fail to realize even people fail to question and even if they realize they don't want to question so i think it's a long process it's a, it's it's a long process of unburdening ourselves you know from these kind of problematic uh, aspects uh, also there's one last uh, observation comment adding to the question of technology if i may elaborate uh, one can always see the kitchen which is still a very much gendered space he talks about essentially the conflict between the patriarchal sense of culinary and the technology that eases out things so people still uh, kind of prefer to do it uh, do all the grinding and the mixing with their hands which uh, which essentially he says is a patriarchal practice of uh, maybe enslaving a woman but yeah again we can say that it is but it is changing and it's not a one day process we the te technology is definitely helping us get there and technology is easing it out so while a lot of uh, women now even in villages they have these uh, basic uh, things like the mixer grinder probably it's there in most houses so it's essentially changing we cannot say it is uh, it is fixed but like you said that uh, this uh, unburdening will take a lot of time it it is a time taking process we cannot it cannot happen in a jiffy no no absolutely absolutely I agree and in fact um, i also you know agree with you atul that where you mention that um, you know uh, you say that wait i just lost the line it was yeah same as cleaning and other things which when done within the familiar domestic space male workers outside so it's a, it's a multi layered kitchen space i think somewhere you mentioned this element of it's it's a multi layered aspect you know and obviously it's a it's a multi layered aspect because 
in a in a kitchen space when you are coming in with technology you you see one thing that obviously it's easing us out but we have to make sure that we don't become you know mechanical uh, which is very crucial and uh, obviously in in terms of exploitation of gender and labor i mean even if the technological gadgets are being just being used by women to cook her things and if a male member comes and says that you know uh, why can't you cook right now things are so easy for you you can cook it by yourself and i it's not my work to cook it's your work to cook your life is made easy with you know with your uh, technological paraphernalia then i think the gender dichotomy remains the same so obviously i i totally agree with you you know to indulge to bring in the question of gender caste economy uh you know so, so, so uh, society culture and so many uh, you know different diverse dimensions in the kitchen space it's a very complex and entangled space actually they are all so much interrelated to each other that at most of the times it's very difficult to you know uh, look into the space in clear cut compartmentalized perspectives uh yeah so there is another a uh, comment people uh, talks about while exploring the domain of kitchen space i think we are looking at specifically the domestic familiar space and thus in that sense restaurants are not really the kitchen space per se this also takes the point of bread maker versus bread earner uh, i i my laptop is working up yeah then he says that people who cook in restaurants are cooking food but they're not really engaging in the kitchen space one is essentially completely contemplating about and they're serving as a bread earner of the family not really bread maker same as cleaning um yeah same as uh, cleaning and other things which went done within the familial system yes totally i think uh, i think this is also an interesting observation that you bring forth because usually in restaurants even in the roadside hotels we have seen that one who cooks the food is not necessarily the one who cleans usually doesn't happen because you have separate people who are responsible for cleaning um so again i mean it takes uh, i think it takes us to that conversation takes us to that discourse that uh you know how much really uh, we are able to create or how much really we are able to um, a kind of generate gender diversity or gender equality through seeing males occupying the kitchen spaces in the restaurants uh and public spaces and women mostly continue to remain imprisoned within the domestic spaces of kitchen so yes it is i don't know yeah. if anybody else will have oh sorry um kashup you were about to say something yeah no it's i think it, it makes perfect sense and i think we have uh, no other comments and rahul sir uh, the hod he he had some other commitments he was supposed to deliver the vote of thanks but uh, he couldn't make it he has other commitments so if any of you do not have any other uh, questions uh, concerns then maybe we can call it a day yes or in case if you wish to just ask a question or just share your comments please feel free to unmute yourself and speak i don't think that's also an issue um and also i mean uh, you you have our email ids as well um uh, in in case you want to share something uh, your agreements disagreements any new points obviously we had so many elements to discuss you know but i mean it cannot be accommodated within this um you know span of time so we'll surely find again a a way in the future to uh you know create a continuation of this discourse i think we all also wanted to talk about the uh, future of uh, food studies in india because uh, it's yeah, not absolutely, essentially absolutely. a structured thing but if if we can make it more structured then maybe there would be more data available to fall back on absolutely I, i feel yes i i think that could, that could be a very good way to begin uh, a, a conversation in the future you know uh, what about food studies and interestingly just to you know see the wrap up if i just wrap up with this that you know uh you know critical food studies is coming up as a discourse in different parts of the world now like for instance in south africa in the university of like some it's it's a mixed up like people from the university of durban western cape kwazulu natal and some other universities they have come up and they have formed this group called the critical food studies 
I mean, you can just type critical food studies on the Google and you can find out their website and they do some really, really amazing uh, stuffs around food discourses and cultures. So I think it's more and more collective efforts are necessary and it's necessary to find, navigate ways how to, you know, build food as a part of a, not just for the sake of as a culinary aspect, but also as a part of a daily cultural discourse, as a part of a pedagogy, as a part of a curriculum, as a part of, you know, teaching and learning on an everyday basis. Exactly. And I think it would make more sense because in India, the food systems are so diverse that we can definitely put it under one umbrella of uh, critical food studies, probably, or food studies, or the recent trends in food studies, something like that. So I'll, I'll say thank you. Thank you to everyone. I, we, were not, we were not expecting so much of responses. It was just like kind of a conversation, but you really made it so interactive. I think I, this was my first experience. I think Dr. Shion has had a lot of such experiences, but it was a wonderful and enriching experience. Thank you, Dr. Shion, for uh, you know, uh, agreeing to do this on a very short notice. And thank you everyone for being here. Thank you so much. Yes, and thank you, Kashupi. Uh, thank you, uh, IIT team and all the members. Thank you, Atul. Thank you, Ankita, Venkatesh, Ananya, Suresh, and everybody whosoever I can see their names, Shagota, Pankoj, Dinamani, Srikant, Anita, and everybody whosoever uh, have been a part of this. Dev Datta, uh, yes. Neelam uh, and uh, Rahul, sir, I think he left uh, for being a part of this you know, conversation. Um, thank you so much. And we hope to keep the conversation going in the future as well. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.